Okay. Hi there. This is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. And today we are going to paint a brachiosaurus. Um, actually, three brachiosauruses. That's a fun word. Brachiosauruses. Uh, anyways, um, this is the letter B for my dino bet. I'm doing this for my... Um, little grandniece Penelope. She's getting the dino bed. Um, I've done a patasaurus, um, and uh, this is the second of the uh, alphabet letters, and it is a brachiosaurus. Um, I didn't um, um, record A, unfortunately. I did do it for um, Azara's Night Monkey, which was is going to my uh, my little grand nephew Gunner, but, uh, so Gunner's getting the ape bet, um, and, uh, Penelope is getting the, um, dino bet. And the thing is, is that, um, I've been doing, I started out doing, um, an animal alphabet and with that one, when I finished it up, that was for my, my, uh, second cousin, Cynthia, and I've got two other alphabets going on. These are very fun. They're easy to do. They don't take very long. I did um, a video on the drawing of this that didn't turn out. My apologies. I'm still getting used to figuring out the wherefores and how I do the videos so that they turn out better. And I figure as I do more of these, um, the videos will get better as well. And hopefully my dialogue in which you're hearing from me gets better. At current, I'm painting the sky in this just because, okay, I got to start with something. So I'm starting with the sky. Um, this is a ultramarine, very light ultramarine with all my watercolors. I will start out with a very, very light um, color of whatever I'm using, especially with the sky. You don't want to go too dark. Um, and you can always come back in afterwards. Um, but right now I'm just painting in the background because you've got to start somewhere. And honestly, sometimes it doesn't really matter where you start. Um, it's very much like when you're a kid and you're coloring in a coloring book. Um, so it's like, where do you begin in, in, in the place you want to go? And sometimes um, I will start with the main figures. Sometimes I'll start with the background. Sometimes I will come in and do an underpainting. I really like um, starting watercolors with an underpainting of burnt sienna. It just all depends on how I'm feeling, where I want to go with the painting. And I hate to say it, years of experience just really does come into play sometimes with what you pick and what you don't pick. And because I'm talking to you about this, um, I'm thinking more along the lines of how I handle things. Okay, so we've, we've finished more, more or less the sky areas in cobalt blue. And um, the brachiosauruses are going to be eating from uh, sequoias, or basically they're, they're um, the types of trees that brachiosauruses used to eat were primarily giant um, conifers and ginkgos. Um, the ginkgos are not as big now as they were back in uh, the Jurassic. These these particular dinosaurs supposedly um, lived during the late Jurassic. Now, um, as to, to painting, you'll note almost all of this painting, the blue here and here and here, it's all gotten dry already. It's it's an interesting thing with, with watercolor. You can tell how things, what stage they are in drain. So I wouldn't want to paint like right here, right now, because with this area being damp, this area will bleed into this area. But this area is relatively dry right now, so I can paint next to that and know whatever I paint here won't bleed into this area here. And the technique I use primarily is um, dry on, excuse me, wet on dry. So I'm using wet watercolor on dry paper. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a little burnt sienna right now to do the, um, the bottom color on the brachiosaurus. 
because I figured they're going to be kind of, I'm going to make them a little bit like the same, um, a similar color to the tree trunks. I'm going to probably add just a little bit of Prussian, or excuse me, Payne's Gray to the red when I go to their backs, just because I want to, um, eh, actually I might do that to the trees instead. I take that back. I'm going to put the Prussian blue in the, the trees. I'm going to keep the, the Brachiosaurus themselves. I'm doing with a very light wash of burnt sienna. And burnt sienna is a red brown. Um, if you want an even redder brown, you'll use terracotta. Terracotta is extreme. It's, it's literally, you know, when you think about terracotta, terracotta is a brick. And so bricks are made out of terracotta. So um, it will be a brick red, whereas burnt sienna is a red brown, but it's not quite as hot, shall you say, I say. It's, it's got a little bit more blue in it than terracotta has. Um, so I, I use burnt sienna quite a bit for underpainting and um, my natural browns period. It's, it's, it's my red to go to. That's, it gives you a nice earth tone without being too intense. And it's also because it is um, in the earth tone family, it's one of those colors that is extremely permanent. It's like when it comes to um, watercolor, watercolor can um, fade over the years, but the more earth tones you use, like the raw, the umbers, uh, the siennas, um, sepia is a bit on the, um, the dye side, um, but they're, they're I tend to use, try to use um, colors that are more heavy in um, pigment rather than dye because that way I know that for the most part um, these paintings as long as they're um, not held out in direct sunlight could live as long as you know anywhere from two to five hundred years and I kind of like the idea that you know after I'm long gone there's a little bit of me that that make somebody smile out there because it's like my, my be best best joy in this world is making somebody smile it just to me that's that there is nothing better than somebody coming up to you and say oh I just love what you do or this really influenced me or what have you these particular dinosaurs just to let you know um, I have a book out there that um, they they own the rights to or you've, if you're familiar with Dover publications they make the best coloring books and way back in the late 80s, I did a dinosaur ABC for them. And the dinosaur ABC that I did for them is still in print. So if you would, I don't get any money if you go and buy their dinosaur ABC by Lynn Hunter. But it makes me happy to know that there are probably tens of thousands of kids and adults out there who have... Um, colored and painted my coloring book over the year and it's still in print that just tickles me pink to no no degree um it's kind of like my my animation if I, I know that um animaniacs has come back and and they're reselling you know the old original animaniacs and i worked on animaniacs and to know that people watch you know that or my curious george I worked on the, the Curious George Halloween special, and that was that was a real popular Halloween special, and that may have influenced a lot of kids. And that that always makes me happy to know that, you know, the work that I have collaborated on with other people out there is has had an influence on somebody and has brought a lot of smiles or entertainment. That to me, there is nothing better than that. You know, as an artist, you're you're, you're you're a performer on the page, and you don't always get to see the results of what you do, but it's always fun that when you're done, you know that somebody has either learned from something you've done or you've made somebody smile. To me, that that is the best. But anyways, as we're going here, it's like we've got, you know, brachiosauruses are all more or less painted down here. And... Uh, I'm going to give them a little bit of dry time. And I think I'm going to use a, just a little bit of, let's see here, a little bit of raw umber.
and raw umber is on the yellow side. It's, it's like, if you want um, like a darker yellow, um, yellow ochre is probably the way to go if you want an earthy yellow that isn't so dark, and then raw umber would be my next yellow. So it's, it's a nice, nice color to use for ground, or um, like I said, it, it's, it gives a yellow brown without being excessively intense. If you use, like I said, yellow ochre tends to speed more intense. Now I'm kind of stippling here, kind of doing a, a blot, 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 because I want to get some texture in the ground and I'm going to go over that again. I'm going to let it dry and then I'm probably going to go over it again with some water to loosen up the brush strokes. And then I'll go over it again, probably with a little bit of um, Payne's Gray or sepia to make it look like mottled ground. And then come through with a little bit of green to pull in the green of the trees into the ground. But right now I'm just dabbling it there with some um, raw umber. Now I'm gonna go into the tree with some hooker's green and start painting up the trees. And Hooker's Green straight out of the tube is a pretty, it's, it's, it's like the green of a Monopoly piece. Um, it's like the, if you're gonna do a green that, that, that looks like, how, how should you say the, uh, your standard green, um, that's Hooker's. This is Hooker's Green Light rather than Deep. I still don't understand what it is or the light and the deep stuff. It's like, why can't you say light and dark? Nope, it's deep. Because I will assume it was a marketing ploy by Windsor & Newton or the first companies that made tubed watercolor paint. Um, how they called colors instead of going... I like the Mun Munsell color system where if you have primary color, it's yellow. Secondary color or primary color red. It's not cadmium. It's or what have you. The thing is, is that when you're dealing with watercolors, they're the names are based on the types of pigments that they use to create the color. It's like the cadmiums use cadmium, and originally um, <laughs> it was the uh, actual radioactive cadmium. Um, which you actually, it's poisonous. Cadmium itself, it's, I don't think it's radioactive. It's, it's extremely poisonous um, pigment. It's like yellows and greens during the ten, turn of the century. One of the things that's a very fascinating thing is that yellows and greens at the turn of the century were actually made out of arsenic and they'd use them on wallpaper. Um, if you're familiar with Wil William Morris or the design work of William Morris, another favorite, famous watercolor painter, famous, famous interior designer, owned his own um, wallpaper factory, designed all the wallpaper prints, well known for his design work at the turn of the century. Well, he did all his beautiful colors in his wallpapers with arsenic and made probably tens of thousands of people sick from his wallpaper and possibly died young from lung disease and kidney disease that were caused by the fact that, oh, I have this beautiful, marvelous wallpaper hanging on my wall and it's made out of arsenic. The good news is, if you're buying watercolors today, um, they're all non-toxic. They, they made a point to do that. If you're getting oil paints, not so much. Um, and you can still get lead white, um, people that it's unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, there's nothing more opaque and more beautiful than lead white made with lead. The alternative for that is zinc white, which is quite nice and a good alternative, but they, they still allow lead white. You can still get it. But again, um, as paints go, that one's one of the poisonous ones. Um, we, if you look on your tube of paint, when you buy it, most of the time, there's an AP standard that says this paint is non-toxic. So 
if your cat or your dog or your kid gets a hold of them and some, for some stupid reason, ate it, you don't have to be worried about it anymore because all watercolors nowadays are pretty non-toxic, even the cadmiums. They've found um, replacement pigment, pigments for the cads. They've <laughs> cobalt, extremely poisonous for the beautiful cobalt blues that they had at the turn of the century. From what I understand, uh, people in the Tiffany factories would often die young because of the fumes from the beautiful cobalt blues that he used to recreate his gorgeous lamps. So that's why you have that nice little uh, label on your paints nowadays that says, this is not toxic. You can actually use this and you won't die from doing a watercolor or um, my cat is notorious for coming in and drinking my my uh, paint water. I keep my paint water in a in a cup, in a nice big mug actually, because um, it's the easiest thing to to uh, use while I'm painting. And she will uh, drink my paint water. There must be something in gum arabic that kitty cats like. And dang it all, if my cat doesn't like to drink paint water. Um, okay, so we've got most of the green in the trees. We've got the burnt sienna in the um, in the brachiosaurus, and we've got the raw umber in the ground. Now you'll note once the the burnt sienna dries, it doesn't hold that nice red color as much. It's dulled out. So one of the things that you do have to be aware of when you're painting in watercolor is that the color will change as you paint and it will change as it dries and it will get less intense depending on the amount of pigment that you've laid down so it's like when it this these i'm currently painting in the trunks of the sequoias or these sequoia like trees with again burnt umber but what i'm or sorry not burnt umber <laughs> sorry about that raw sienna this is raw sienna it's the red stuff um, and you'll note it as it goes down, it's going down a lot darker because I'm basically, I'm loading up my brush with a little bit more pigment than what I laid down with the initial brachiosaurus. And the, the thing is, is that again, that's something you're just, it, it comes by playing with. You'll, you'll figure out how much water and pigment to mix to get a certain amount of pigment into your brush. Um, after a while it becomes second nature and it really if I can't express enough do a lot of little paintings I mean this this painting right here is three by three inches and I'm using this particular brush is a zero it's a Winsor's Newton series 7 um, I live by them it's like I've used this one so much you can't even see half the numbers on it anymore it's probably time to get a new brush, but this brush is probably at least five to ten years old. I have a number of brushes, but it's like until they're like totally dead, <laughs> they're expensive, so I usually, you know, hang on to the same brush for quite a long time. And this particular brush, I have probably been using at least five to ten years. Series seven, they're expensive, they last, they are worth the money. Um, don't balk at them. I mean, if you're afraid of the price, like I said, start small. This is a zero. I would get um, a zero and a one to begin with. If you're doing large areas, if you want to paint backgrounds, don't get any bigger than a two. I use two for inking. One of the reasons why my twos actually um, die on me more is because I will use them as ink brushes, and I'm not the person to separate out my brushes. I'm really bad about that. So it's like I'll clean them, but I won't separate them out, so my twos die faster than any of my other brushes. My ones and my zeros will last a long time because I use them primarily just for watercolor. Um, I also, when I'm painting in acrylic, I will use acrylic brushes for, or um, synthetic brushes for acrylic paint. And I usually use the low, um, uh, what is it, low um, Cornell the low carnel brushes um, because um, I find that of the um, the synthetic brushes I have a tendency to like theirs best 
um, and I'll use those for acrylic. Now what I'm doing here is I'm using a little bit of Prussian blue for my shadows in the trees. And again, the shadows go on the underside. Light's coming from the top. You know, mostly light's coming down this way. You, it's for ambient light. So when you've got, these are big balls of green. So the shadows I'm gonna put in blue. I'm gonna put under. So think, think about every mass of where a tree is like a ball and this is the the uh, core shadow on the underside of a ball and I'm just putting them in like little stipples little dots because of course we've got leaves so you're gonna stipple with the leaves you're gonna put in dots and when you lay on that that Prussian blue it mixes in with the uh, green below and it'll either feel like blue or it'll feel like a blue green underneath those tree leaves. And I personally when I'm, I'm, I'm painting I like to make my shadows either blue I have a tendency to go blue or purple with my shadows. I'll sometimes, uh, sometimes if it, it's green I'll throw in burnt sienna's shadow um, I have I keep my palette actually pretty limited because for the most part um, when you run at least two watercolor colors together you get a wide variety of color in them now okay so there's my my shadow in the trees and I'm gonna need to put some shadow on the ground so I'm gonna pull out a little purple And this is permanent mauve and literally violet. And I mix the two because it's like um, the mauve is always too red and the purple is always too blue. And so the the regular purple um, is too dark. So that, that purple with too much blue in it is too dark. And um, the, the, the mauve is a little bit too pinky. It's too red. So I like to mix the two purples together to kind of get <laughs> to get the 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 um, warmth or coolness of the purple that I like. I haven't been able to find a purple straight out of the tube that satisfies me, and that's just that's a personal thing. So I'm going to put in the shadows in a purple underneath, and because the, the ground is more yellow. That makes the, um, I always like Judy Crook, my color teacher at uh, Art Center, would always say, shadows turn to their complement. So if you're painting, if you've got a yellow ground, your shadow's definitely going to be purple. Now it's like if I were doing the trees right, I probably should have thrown, up, and I may still throw a little red in there, but... Um, I like the way the blue looks. Okay. And our dinosaurs there. I'm going to take a little bit of burnt sienna and mix it in with my my purple. And we're going to see what I how that comes out in the shadow. That's not too bad. And my big problem with this is right now that might be a little dark. Because usually the undersides of animals is usually on the light side more than the dark side. So this isn't going to, you know, I should have probably left that white if I wanted, you know, a lighter belly. And I didn't. And mind you, we don't know what brachiosaurs actually, what color they looked like were. Or, um, we know um, their size. We know their shape from the bones that we found. And they found them primarily in Tanz Tanzania and in Colorado. Um, the largest brachiosaur, I understand, um, was in uh, found in Colorado. However, um, there's one, um, I think it's an Ultrasaurus, that is like supposed to be the biggest brachiosaur. And I'm trying to think if they found that in China? 
I'd have to look that up again. Without without a book right in front of me, I can't tell you for sure on that one. Because I used to be the dinosaur queen, um, or that's what I called myself for a year. For a year when I was a full-time illustrator, I was doing nothing but dinosaurs. I sent out one um, mailer with some dinosaurs on it to several publishers, and boy, that year I just got tons of dinosaur work, which was delightful. And the thing is, is that while you're drawing the dinosaurs, you're not really reading about the dinosaurs because it's like, okay, I've got a deadline. I got to get this done. I've got all kinds of reference. Here's all my photo reference. Here's what they look like. Here's what they ate. Good. Okay. I can put them in an environment, but, but you're not like memorizing. Okay. It was this big. It was found by this individual. It was found in this country. Those things aren't as important when you're drawing and painting the animal as much as um, if you're trying to find out more about the history of paleontology or finding that sort of thing. Right now, it's like, just painting the dinosaurs. Okay, so, modeling up the ground a bit. Like I said, I'm putting in water to where I originally painted just the the little splotches because they've had enough time to dry now and they will then dissolve but they will also leave behind shape as well so the ground will feel a little more mottled for the shape that I left in there plus I want to I'm letting the water flow so that I don't get any um, areas of white I want the the ground all to be colored so if I just blend in with some water that'll take away the white that's in there and then I have some blue areas that I don't want to be left white in the background there underneath the trees so what I'll do is I'll put my brush in a little bit of blue paint and a little bit of water so it's like it's very very thin right now and then the ground will filter up into the area where the sky is too. So you'll get a feeling of maybe a little bit of a blurry background that way. So it's a little bit of a, an extra wash. So I'm, I'm, so I don't, like I said, I want to make sure that the letter itself is filled with color. So it, the, there's no um, white that's per se standing out in this particular one. There might be little spots of white that sparkle through, which is okay. Um, which always happen, which happens a lot. I shouldn't say always happens, but happens a lot with watercolor. But for the most part, I want to get the background filled with color. So I'm currently right now. It's, I'm, I'm painting with water, not with any paint, so that I'm just filling in these white areas and allowing the paper to pull the dissolved watercolor into the area where I've added water. So the, this, this, it's relatively, you can see there's probably a little bit of green that I got into there. So I took the green out of the paint, put fresh water in there. Now, now the sky's more blue, but if a little bit of green gets in there, that's okay. It's just pulling the color around. Okay. Now, I'm going to go back in and give our brachiosaurs, let's see here, what kind of color do we want to give across their backs? I'm having troubles making a decision here. Um, I think I'm going to give a little bit of sepia. Sepia or, or Payne's Gray. Hmm. Hmm. I know. I'm going to do a little bit of raw umber. Hmm. And sepia. Because the sepia is a pretty dark color. 
and I don't want to get it to looking like black per se but I do want it to be kind of a dark brown so I'm taking um, some sepia and some burnt umber and I'm going to give it kind of a giraffe type markings. Now mind you, I don't think that brachiosaurs would have to have per se giraffe type markings because um, with giraffes they still are prey animals, they still run in a, a herd and the reason why they've got the spots is a combination of it looks kind of like shadows from the trees so you can't it breaks up the shape of the animal because it's such a large animal and if you have several giraffes that got their necks sticking up into um, a large acacia tree because I think I believe that's what they do eat acacias in um, Africa and if they, you've got a lot of them with their heads up in a tree, you can't tell how many giraffes there are. If they're in a group together, because of the, the dots, it breaks up the outline and you can't really tell how many there are or which one is an individual. And that's the way zebras work too. Um, all those lines are basically so you can't tell they're in a, you can't tell how many there are in a group. It's a type of camouflage. Now with an animal like this, this probably be more like an um, elephant that wouldn't need any kind of marking. Because you look at elephants, they don't have any markings at all. They're just gray. But here's the other thing with elephants. Um, they have a tendency to take on the color of whatever dirt they're rolling in. They, they take dust baths and they roll in the mud. And so they, they have a tendency to have a mottled gray coat primarily because um, that's how they keep the, the ticks and the insects off of them. So the thing is with giant dinosaurs like this, you know, what kind of coat would they have? Would they have, have, uh, you know, dotted skin or not? And what I'm doing is, I, as I've gotten done with this, I'm going, mm, I'm not sure I like the really dark color I've gotten from the, uh, I'm blotting out, put too much water down. Um, um, not sure I like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my water. This is just straight water that I've taken out of the, uh, the cup. And I am going to just throw the water on it and dissolve those babies because I'm, I'm not so pleased with that color and let the water evaporate just a bit. I'm gonna blot it out, but I'm gonna wait until the water has had a chance to melt, melt those dots a bit. I did it on this background one too. Now, there's been just enough time for this water to evaporate, it's, you can tell there, it's already started the foxing and the dissolving of the watercolor here. And I'm just, I've let it dry just enough. You can see there's still a sheen on there, um, but it's not, it's at that mid drying point. And I'm going to take my paper towel and blot it. So you can see the spots are still there and there's some color there but they're not that really dark spotting that I had before. And now it m looks more like the markings are there, but it's more like a mottled coat. I do the same thing with this one. And it's like, just because I didn't like the really dark, but you can tell that the color is just different enough. The, it gives the, a nice pattern on his back. Okay. Now down the ground here, this ground is like really, really boring. So we've got all that, that yellow there. I'm going to take a little bit of Hooker's Green and I'm going to take a slightly smaller brush. I've got a um, double lot here. And I'm going to 
dry it, brush some plants down in here. And I'm just giving allusion to it. Not necessarily grass because uh, in the Jurassic, I don't believe the grasses were really big in the Jurassic. Um, these would be more like probably um, ferns or, fox or um, horsetails down here. But because our, our brachiosaurs are so big, you know, this is this is just detailing to pull in some of the the green that's up here down into the floor of the uh, piece. Now you can see that there's still a little bit of this, this area here is still damp, so I don't want to be painting on that yet. Um, this area here has gotten dry enough for me to paint on it, and there's all this. There's purple in the shadows down here, and the blue up here, and I want to pull in a little bit of blue down into the dinosaur. So I'm going to put a little bit of blue in their shadows too, just a. to pull what's going on in the trees into the dinosaurs. Because of the, like I said, there's a, what happens is when you get an overall evenness in the color, um, there's a boredom that comes to your eye. You need, it's almost like you, your eye needs a little bit of spice. It's almost like adding pepper. So I, I'll pull in colors it's a way to harmonize the entire painting so that, that um, some colors that you find up in here will also come in down here. And those, are, those little accents really, really make it. It's like I said, it's like adding a little bit of pepper or adding, you know, you have got, you've got a chicken dish and you want to add just a few drops of lemon juice. You know, or you want to add just a little bit of cayenne pepper. And not a lot, just a little bit, just to, like, spice it up. Just make it a little bit more interesting so you, your eye is not bored by just the brown. Okay. That's a little heavy, so... And again, whenever something lays down too heavy, you can always blot it away with a paper towel, which I just did. That blue is, you know, I want a hint of blue. I don't want it like looking like a huge chunk of turquoise. I want an accent. So it's like if it went too heavy, fine. Just blot it away. Okay. And I'm going to... I think the term is cyclids. These, I, I started making these little uh, humpy like balls back here to make them look like cyclids. Okay. And again, his neck's a little bit too heavy on the Now, I am going to take, do something really different. Now, I said that, that, that those um, brown lines were too heavy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add some interest here. We've got the spotting and we got all these kind of stipply lines. So I'm going to give them stripes. I'm going to give them like little stripes. because we don't know what the dinosaurs looked like. They could have looked like anything. We, and the thing is, is that what you try to do when you're, you're doing dinosaurs is give an allusion to some kind of animal that, that might have, has a similar niche in the ecology today. So I'm kind of mixing stripes and dots here. But we've got all kinds of patterns of animals in our environment, too. 
Have you ever looked at zebra stripes or a stripe within stripe on the um, gravies? Yeah, that makes it more interesting. It also because I'm I'm using lines that gives me a little bit more volume in the dinosaur by giving some making the, the lines go around. Now that I'm done with that, I'm looking at those, the trees in the background are a little bit too heavy. They stand out a bit too much. So I'm going to take um, some just fresh water and I am going to basically lighten these up. I started on them out going darker than the dinosaurs in front. But I'm not sure that I want that. So I'm going to lighten them up. And then I think I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to go back in with the blue. Over that entire area. And that way I do I get them more of a, a faded into the background feel. And when you're painting, that's this is the kind of thing that I find that I do when I'm painting. You'll make decisions that you think, okay, that worked, and then you go, no, maybe that's not working. take the blue now. I'm, a, I'm going back and I'm using ultramarine. And it's a real light ultramarine. I'm just going to go into all the blue again. And ultramarine is a, a blue that's on the purple side or the red side. And mind you, again, with all watercolors, the they always dry completely, um, not the way you've expected them. <laughs> I've, I've never had a watercolor quite turn around the, the way I expected it to. And usually that's for the better. Because <laughs> it'll, it'll feel um, maybe a bit dull or muddy or what have you, and all of a sudden you let it sit for a couple of hours and it comes out ex <laughs> the, exactly the way you planned it to. Close to, to more to what you had in mind. Um, so if you're feeling, okay, this isn't coming out the way I want it to, or it really doesn't have the feel that I intended, uh, give it an hour. <laughs> Trust me, they usually come out ten times better than what you originally intended. Okay, now I'm going to lighten up the sky a little bit. So I'm going to take, whereas I added blue down below, I'm going to take some of this, try to take some of this out. There we go. And we're just about done here. Okay. I'm going to even up this leg. And I think I'm going to go over just a little bit more uh, burnt sienna over the top. Just 
giving it a little bit of bread in here. A little bit of red accent. So it's like where I took the trees down, I'm kind of picking up the, the di dinosaurs. There we go. Now when this dries, I'll go over the whole thing with the ballpoint pen one more time. The problem with going over it now is that um, the painting is wet and the ballpoint pen won't work well on the painting. So I might do one more um, portion to this painting. Otherwise, this is done. Um, again, my name is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. You can follow me on Patreon. Um, if you like the video, please make sure you like, subscribe. Um, and uh, I, my Patreon's very inexpensive, 12 bucks a year. That's it. So thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Go play with some dinosaurs of your own.